All righty. Hello and welcome everyone to live at Epifan on this fine, fine Thursday afternoon. It is three o'clock Eastern on every other Thursday, I guess. This is one of those every others. And Dan and I are here to talk about some stuff, some streaming news and some other cool news. And honestly, we have a pretty interesting, pretty interesting show today, if I'm honest. I, I'm kind of excited for this one. Uh, yeah, we got Dan, some how are you? How are you feeling? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, we got some interesting topics, so... Um... We could dive right into it. Um, why don't we start the show off with the rundown? The lowdown, the rundown. We're still going to have to stick to. Is one it the of lowdown? Well, yeah, that's what the graphics. The says, important thing so. is that it's down. <laughs> yeah, it's on the DL either way. Um, so, yeah, there's some interesting stuff. And do you want to talk and start this off? I think yeah. we both have a lot to say about this. Yeah, first one. and uh, so right off the top, uh, we came across this just last week. Actually, this is Theta. It's your newest, freshest blockchain cryptocurrency network. Um, but something a little interesting going on with this one. It is yeah. creating a decentralized network for content delivery. Uh, what do you know about this, George? Yeah, so I've been experimenting with this a little bit, um, and uh, right now I wouldn't say it's great. The theory is very cool, and I think, Dan, you and I both agreed that the theory here is pretty good. The, the theory being having a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network um, that potentially could decentralize something like a YouTube or a Twitch, right? So instead of relying on these massive companies that centralize all of this in a few key locations, which can sometimes slow down your access to that content or restrict your access to that content. The idea here is to leverage blockchain technology and peer-to-peer, end-to-end stuff to decentralize a video platform. And at the same time, leveraging the aspects of cryptocurrencies to fund it within its own ecosystem so you you know instead of let's say on twitch for anyone familiar with that where you might donate bits to someone to because you like their channel in this case you can become a edge node for the network which means you're one of the peers and that can help you earn some of the tokens which is a cryptocurrency essentially and you can use those to donate to other users um so you get rewarded for being a participant and then you can also use that to reward others as content creators it, it then becomes its own micro economy basically um that stuff all sounds really cool i'll be honest it, it, it sounds sounds really neat my experiments with it thus far however <laughs> um and admittedly that's only just been today but so far my experiments have been um less yeah. than stellar yeah you mentioned you were playing it with it and you actually set up your own node on the network I did. so uh maybe you could tell us a bit about that and do you have anything you can can you show us what the interface looks like what i can what? actually yeah if, uh, if I, I can do a screen share and uh and kind of show off what it looks like um don't worry there's no information you can actually steal from this but uh i'll show this here um, and so, so this, this is essentially what the software installed on Windows looks like. They make a Windows version and a Mac version. Um, and when you install it, you first have to set up a wallet like you do for any crypto. And that's secure. You can see my address there. That doesn't need to be hidden. That's public information. So don't worry, you're not going to get anything good by knowing that. Um, and basically, that's where you would earn rewards or people donate to you and you get it. There's some other compute things here. For example, you can even turn on a folding from home aspect to this app as well. So if you're someone who's into those kind of uh, compute projects, then you know you can do that. And then the biggest piece is there's two aspects of this here with both a watch discover page as well as a broadcast page. And so far, I would say most of the content up here is basically junk <laughs> um, from what I've seen so far. It's it's mostly a lot of nonsense. Um, honestly, the app looks good. It feels pretty good to use, but you, I, I think some of the problems that I've been running into mostly have been um, just weird stuff that just doesn't load. Like let's, sometimes you'll try to watch a stream 
and it just sits here at this fetching playlist and maybe it's because i'm located in an area where there's not enough peers yeah i'm assuming that's what it is it but it looks like you're connected to 17 peers something like that yeah 17 peers there's apparently seven people watching this particular stream but not me <laughs> oh it finally loaded but then you'll notice here it gets a chunk but then it hits the end of that chunk and has to buffer and it gets another chunk and eventually that improves over time but so far essentially my experience with this has been the opposite of what their objective to solve is right so they're they're trying to solve buffering and load times by making this peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized my experience so far with the state their network is in now is that all it is is buffering and waiting <laughs> mm -hmm. um so the Can network you... is not there yet obviously it has to scale but what about the concept the theory of a decentralized content delivery network what's your take on that i think there's some really interesting possibilities to that um you know, first of all, you're not relying on a major entity that, good or bad, can free you from restrictions. Um, and everyone will have their own opinions on that. And that's that's fine. We don't need to go into those opinions, right? But when you're going to a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized system, you are unshackled from regulation. Again, good or bad. Um, so... I think there are aspects of that that are good, but there's obviously some things that are potentially a risk or not so great about it, right? So what protection is there from someone just streaming pornographic content up here? Nothing, absolutely nothing. There is, there's no control to that, which means if it's running on your family computer because you like to play with this stuff and your child sits in front of it, there's no checks and balance to that. So that's yeah. that's a risk. I mean, that's only one I mean, this example, is, of course. This is in its infancy. This is, you know, it is. kind of it kind is. of a proof of concept, really, at this point. Um, yeah. And, and there are some companies that are interested in this as a theory. You know, there's some big companies that are providing anchor points. So there's kind of two different layers. There's edge nodes and then kind of these anchor nodes. Those anchor nodes are going to be big data centers somewhere of someone participating in that. And there's some big companies doing that, which is kind of funny because the whole point is to decentralize. But yet you have companies like Google and Samsung participating in this experiment as well. So um, it's curious. It's interesting. Um, I kind of like the idea. In theory, you get you get rewarded for just having uptime participating as a peer. So there, there's like most cryptos, right? You participate, you get, you're rewarded. Uh, so there's there's some interesting stuff here. The other Very part cool. that could be good is that you anybody can technically broadcast. The problem I have with is the methodology they set up for that it is kind of dumb. <laughs> um, essentially, they want you to run streaming software like OBS, streaming to yourself using a, basically a, a local loopback address. And I won't go deep into what that means, but networking people will understand what I mean. And then that's how it gets into the app, which is how it gets onto the network. That seems a bit crazy to me. Like there should just be some other ingestion method like any other CDN. And maybe that's something that will improve over time. But at the moment, it that seems really convoluted and, you know, a bit weird to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have to keep our eye on this. You know, maybe this one yeah. isn't what's going to take off. But, you know, you look at something like BitTorrent, 20 years ago right diff difficult to use to to uh you know really depends on the strength of the network right of what yeah. capabilities that network will have so it's a bit of a chicken egg scenario maybe right now like what's incentivizing to use this video platform versus mature platforms that actually work <laughs> Right. So, right. And, and, and ultimately, you know, the, the space of video content creators out there, and we have a story a little later about exactly this, is all about where people are going to make money. Right. Because ultimately money is whether it's fiat currency or cryptocurrency, money is still the driving factor for content creators. Right. People want to be paid for their work. They want to be paid for their art, et cetera. And, you know, at the moment, you're not going to make any money on this. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. So especially not compared to other platforms, which I think is where we'll get to that in, a, in another story. So 
but it's curious if anyone's interested uh i think it's uh what was the address again dan you had up the website there a moment ago theta token.org if you want yeah, to check so it out if anyone's curious check into it um Dan and, and I and Epifan have no affiliation <laughs> to this other than curiosity. Um, but it is one of the hot things out there for the crypto nerds. So, <laughs> um, Speaking of nerds, uh, Apple, um, well, video engineering nerds. We like to, tr we like <laughs> to like, uh, sort of lurk on this video engineering Reddit thread. And you came across this, mm -hmm. George, and people were asking... Um, Anybody know what CDN Apple is using for their keynote address? I'm assuming Apple had a keynote recently. Yeah, this was the so, WWDC keynote stuff. There's some questions from WWDC. You know, what are the what is Apple using here? What is this player? What is this this CDN? Um, do you have any idea, I, George? I don't. Um, being Apple, it's probably something of their own creation. Um, but uh, they were people were asking because there was certain functionality in there, including live transcription and things like that, 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 that seem to be really effective and powerful, um, which is a segue into something we'll talk about later too. Um, but in general, it was as usual for, for an Apple event. It was very slick, it looked good, the quality was high, and it seemed to have some features that people weren't seeing in your typical players out there that you might see with Vimeo or YouTube or any of the others. So it um, people were asking this question. So if anyone knows, that would be uh, that would be amazing. I would I would love to hear more about about because I don't think anybody knows, and it's curious to see what underlying technology they were using. Um, I guess we were interested in that, Dan, because you and I hear from customers every day who are looking for sometimes very unique feature sets within the player side of a stream. Mm -hmm. And yeah, things like real time uh, closed captions, things like camera amera, uh, language selection, if you have two yeah. languages. And um, ultimately, people are always looking for, you know, uh, viewer operated switching of camera angles and stuff like that, which is something that everyone wants, but to, isn't really a thing yet because they don't understand the complexity of what that really entails. But um, yeah, it, it's it's. It's fascinating to see that there are some things improving and evolving, though. Um, speaking of improving and evolving, Microsoft Teams, <laughs> always looking for the next way to provide more value. And now <laughs> that is being accomplished by partnering with Starbucks. And so is the Starbucks... value for <laughs> Starbucks shareholders? Is that the value in this? <laughs> uh, perhaps. Um, I mean, they're both headquartered in seattle no uh That's, yeah, exactly, so maybe there's yeah. some friendship deal happening there i don't know probably, but uh probably. yeah there's a, a starbucks app that is now integrated with microsoft teams and makes it really really easy to order a coffee for your team or for your f colleague uh and to uh sort of create some social interaction around that so did you see this, George? What do you what do you think about I, what Teams is doing? Is this is this the natural progression of things with with uh, <laughs> with video conferencing now? You know what? Actually, in a way, yes. I mean, I have a particular distaste for Starbucks product because it's just not very good. As as someone who's a bit of a coffee snob, but Starbucks is last on the list. Um, but I think the concept is actually really interesting, right? Because we're talking about, like, ignore the brands that are involved. It's just the concept of, you know, we've talked about it before on the show, that the reality is remote work is going to become a, a new part of the normal coming out of the pandemic, right? Yes, there's going to be big chunks of people that are going to go back to old kind of normal in offices and stuff. But we also know, we talked about this a bit last week, I think, that there's a lot of people that want to stay remote, but one of the hardest parts about remote, and Dan, you and I know this all too well, is that you sit in Zoom for six hours a day, Teams in six hours a day, there's still a certain interaction that's missing. And sometimes it's as simple as having a coffee with a colleague or, you know, here, obviously in Canada, especially where our offices are located every day at almost set times, you would see people 
leave the offices as these little social groups within the companies walk down to Tim Hortons and get a coffee. They're all chatting. They're having an interaction outside. Come back and get back to work. Yeah. And, that's and a lot of good ideas that, happen during those interactions, oh, yeah. right? Like that's I there's mean, a lot of creativity and inspiration that comes from rubbing shoulders randomly, you know, during a work. Right. Day, right. And we don't need to go into the very deep history of coffee houses and how they've been responsible for shaping the modern world. Um, but like that's that is still true to some extent. Right. Like there's the jokes about the person who's writing a script in Starbucks. Right. But like it happens and yeah. it happens from business perspective. It happens from an individual creator perspective. So yeah, I don't think we've seen the end of this. We could see things like, I mean, Cameo, you can invite uh, mm -hmm. a, a guest into your zoom session a celebrity guest into your zoom yeah. session um what else there's there's uh there's you know opportunities for perhaps games or other social activities inside your video conferencing application so but the direct integrations make it easier right like we've done it here where we'll have a team lunch and you know get uber eats to deliver food to everybody but there's a delay it's a whole separate process it's kind of annoying it's fully integrated into a platform you're already sitting in front of everybody just just takes down more barriers so to me it's it's a fascinating concept i don't particularly care for starbucks like i said but the concept i like uh switching gears here a little bit we were following some news about twitch we like to kind of keep tabs <laughs> on what's happening in the twitch world um, it's forefront of live this, streaming, man. <laughs> this seems to be a common story. Um, this is uh, Twitch streamer Miskif mm -hmm. uh, revealing some of his monthly earnings. And uh, this this uh, streamer is earning currently over $500,000 per month uh, streaming yes. on Twitch. And this yeah. is becoming a more and more common story. Um, and I think you know, the mainstream traditional media networks maybe don't realize just how lucrative it is oh. it can be to be a content creator on Twitch. Um, you know, sole proprietor, single operator, running his own content and making millions. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. Wild. And, and it, it's funny because it, it also has been a big shift from a number of years ago when YouTube kind of went through the adpocalypse phase, right? It, that really reduced the amount of revenue a lot of creators are making on VOD content on YouTube. And a lot of them moved to Twitch and started doing live content. And the, there is a difference. And it kind of ties back to what we were talking about with Theta before, right? Is that there's a direct funding model with Twitch. And that's why it's so lucrative for some of these people who end up with larger audiences, right? Like this guy's getting 20,000 subs a month or whatever it is. On average, he's probably making $3 per sub, right? And what and what uh, are the costs of developing his content? They've got to be extremely minimal, Next to right? nothing. Like, next he's in a room nothing. in his house. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's, re he's reinvested some of it. Like, I mean, yeah. from his origins to where he's at now, he's definitely reinvested in it. But... These guys also target a gaming audience and they're using like the headset he's wearing is from a gaming brand. He probably got that for free from a sponsorship deal, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's 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 cash plus, right? Like it's it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, this guy's in his mid twenties, raking in half a million dollars a month. That's more than hockey players at that age make, right? Yeah, like it's, <laughs> it's pretty serious. Well, serious. it just goes and, to show how much money and how much, yeah. uh, you know, investment there is in this yeah. sort of, you know, content create, sole proprietor content creation world. It's it's absolutely amazing. And, and the pandemic has kickstarted that in a big way because everyone looked for other sources of revenue if they previously had an in-person gig job, right? They they needed to go somewhere else. We We had my friend John on a few weeks ago kind of talking a little bit about that and that's not an uncommon story that you got to pivot that was an easy pivot get it going make some money doing it and if you explode make potentially make a ton of money doing it um so yeah next time your kid tells you they want to live stream for a living don't think it's that crazy yeah all those roblox videos might uh exactly. might be worth more than you realize <laughs> exactly um, another story we were following. This is um, uh, Sinclair, big U.S. media company, has just in invested $250 million in a new 
OTT sports streaming service. Um, and they're looking to launch a new OTT platform for next year's Major League Baseball season. So Interesting. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are, George, with the term OTT. Could you kind of maybe try to break it down for the viewer? It stands for over the top, but it can. I've seen people use it in a lot of weird ways, so I'm curious what they intend in this case. Yeah, so um, it looks like they are planning to stream like 14 to 16 national or Major League Baseball teams, as well as some hmm. NBA and some NHL. And they also acquired some rights from Disney. So hmm. um, who knows? Maybe this could be an app that you'll download on your right. smart TV. Maybe this could be, you know, yet again, another streaming service. Um, right. But it just goes to show how, you know, sort of fragmented the content streaming world is becoming. Uh, you know, it's yeah. no longer your only option is to go to a, a major cable provider. You have so many options now. You can buy your baseball package from the league, right? Or you right. can get a comprehensive package from, uh, you know, sort of a third tier media company like Sinclair. So right. um, just more sort of, uh, you know, we use the term democratization of content, more options for viewers, more, you know, un. Uh, it's more choice, but it's also more fragmentation. So it's yeah. kind of a... It's a tough one to figure out where it is uh, in terms of the, the pro and win call, you know, pro win and con columns of like, which, where do we actually end up with it? Um, you know, we, we talked last week a little bit about some legislation issues here in, in, in Canada that could totally screw up a lot of this stuff, right? That, that, that ends up regulating your options. And that's so in theory, more options can circumvent that stuff. And so maybe that's good, but Maybe it isn't. I, I don't know. We'll have to see. I'm curious because that's just an interesting play for, for that particular organization to, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, on the topic of media regulation, saw this story <laughs> pop up, George, I think. I'm not sure who found this, but um, CBC, Canada's national broadcaster, turning off comments on their Facebook news posts for the next month. Um, <laughs> I guess they don't like the comments that are coming in on their news articles what's going on here <laughs> i i didn't look too much in detail on it to be honest and part of that was because i just glanced at the headline and went yeah i've looked at the comments i kind of make sense because <laughs> it is toxic like it's ugly and so i get it i totally get it um you know, it's it's as again, we are content creators to to an extent. We put stuff out there. Some of the comments we sometimes get, it's it's hard. You know, sometimes you put a lot of work into a particular piece of content, you put it out there, and the only comments you get back are extremely negative and toxic. And it, it does hurt. It really does. Like it sounds silly to just say like ah, I just blow it off because it's social media, but. Sometimes it's hard to not just be like, man, really? I spent so much time and effort on this and all I have is people dumping on it. And it's, um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of get it. And especially when you're talking about public news stuff, especially everything that's been going on for the past 15 months, things can get crazy real quick. People are stressed. People are hot-headed. Everything's just kind of nuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't blame them, but it is a bit weird. It definitely like one small change can make a big difference in the culture around these platforms, right? Mm -hmm. You look back at like Instagram removing the being able to see how many likes there are on a photo. They did that a couple years ago and now they're putting it back in, but it's an option right. if you want to turn that on or not. Right. So, yeah. yeah, it's just interesting to see how these engagement tools will play out. Um, yeah, you know, Facebook's taking a lot of flack for, uh, you know, the options that you can use to engage. Like you've got like now you've got the care option, which is like new mm -hmm. since the pandemic. So, yeah, like little micro adjustments can make a big difference in our culture. So it'll still be no dislike button, which yeah. is what drives people to be toxic in the comments because they can't just do an emoji dislike. I'm serious about that. That's just logic, right? I would react negatively to things instead of leaving negative comments sometimes. Yeah. And it wouldn't be as impactful. Right. So, yeah. Anyway. 
Um, why don't we shift gears a little bit, George? And uh, I'm getting a little uh, drowsy. I might need another cup of coffee. So why don't we head over mm. to the kitchen? Yeah, I'll meet you down in the kitchen. So uh, a couple things we wanted to talk about that are happening around Epifan this week. First mm -hmm. of all, we've got some product news with a new firmware release. Maybe you can uh, let us know what's going on, George. Yeah, so we released a new firmware version for all three Pearl models, uh, Pearl Nano, Pearl Mini, and Pearl 2. Um, it has some cool stuff built in there. Not something for everybody, but something for a lot of people. Um, one of the big ones is the multi-viewer feature. This is a feature that's been requested for a long time on the Pearl family of products. Being able to use the HDMI output ports as a split multi-viewer like you might see on a traditional broadcast console uh, from a Pearl. You know, in the past, people would have to create an encoding channel on like a Mini or a Pearl 2, create their, their split, assign that to the HDMI output. The problem is, and, and anyone who's been in demos with me over the years knows I, I, you know, I start with this. A channel in a Pearl is an encoder, and an encoder that exists is occupying CPU time and negatively impacting the performance potentially. The less channels, the better. So if we don't need them, don't have them. And having to do that for multi-view previously is not great for a lot of customers who are pushing some of those Pearls upper their limits already even before adding the multi-view now this multi-view feature means you don't have to do it in a channel save yourself that extra headroom on the cpu and just set it up on the hdmi output um, so this is honestly a fantastic tool uh, for for certain people who are using you know a, a larger confidence monitor for production use right there on the pearl um, i spoke with a customer the other day who's going to use this in they they have a user experience lab essentially and their observation room they, the old way they had to do the channel and all that kind of stuff now they can use the multi-view to feed the 85 inch tv they have in the observation room instead and that's going to save them headroom to do something else on the pearl and improve their use case overall so this is going to be awesome very cool there was also some cms enhancements mm -hmm. right Exactly, yeah. So we enhanced some of the integrations with Panopto and Kaltura. A lot of it had to do with Panopto this time. It kind of goes back and forth between those two and when we roll out feature things here. But one of them is with Panopto to be able to pause and resume your events when they're running, whether that's a live stream or a recording. Um, and they basically just get stitched back together on the Panopto side. So it's all kind of automated. But if you need to pause for some reason, you can do that, resume. And then also supporting templates to be created and pushed from the Panopto side to the Pearl. So for our, a lot of our customers out there that are using Pearls, especially Pearl Minis in the education environment, this is going to be, and they're happy to be Panopto customers as well, this is going to be an awesome update for them uh, to be able to do that. Very cool. Anything else you want to touch on with the new firmware update, George? Uh, the rest was gone as the kind of maintenance stuff. Um, updated some things around the RTSP protocol, um, some local console keyboard shortcuts, kind of these are maintenance things. Um, and then the other one that can be a bigger deal, which is Pearl 2 only, is we did update the NDI version to 4.6.2. Of course, we basically did that the same day that they announced NDI 5 is coming. So, you know, we released that and then we're right back to the drawing board to look at NDI 5. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, but uh, that'll take a little more time to, to roll that out. Awesome. So if people want to get the new 4.14.2 firmware... You can, of course, uh, find it right in the upgrade option, right in your admin panel on your Pearl. So, or through Epifan Cloud, if you're managing a fleet, good way to do it. Um, another new feature that I wanted to tell you about, George, we now have um, a new LiveScript beta feature called Speech mm -hmm. Context. And Speech Context can help to drastically increase the transcription capability for unknown words. Um, so one of the issues that people may often run into with automated sp speech transcription is that, you know, proper nouns like names or company names or places may not always be picked up correctly by um, the speech automation software. Yeah. Now we have a new feature called speech context that can help 
um, to increase the recognizability of those words, uh, which is very cool. So why don't I show you around here, George? Um, sure. I, yeah, like, I haven't looked at this at all yet. I, you know, I heard about it in the kitchen, but I haven't, uh, I haven't actually had a chance to play with it or look at it at all. So this is really interesting. Yeah, I was just taking a, a, a look this morning, and uh, it's really quite straightforward and easy to use, which is, which is cool. So um, first of all, um, all you have to do to get the new beta feature on your live script is restart your device. The firmware will up update itself automatically. And then what you want to do is you go into your FFN Cloud dashboard and navigate to your live script tab. And here you can manage your device. And you'll see here I've got all my device information. Um, I can stop because we had a transcription going before, so I'll just <laughs> stop that for now. Um, but all you need to do is navigate here to the transcription tab. And as you scroll down, you're going to see a new field here right at the bottom. I'll zoom in a little bit to make it a little easier for everyone to see. So right here at the bottom, you have this field speech context. It is a beta feature. And all you have to do is enter your words that you want to cr increase recognition for right here. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to sort of teach the algorithm, uh, the speech recognition algorithm to sort of increase the preference for these words if a similar sound comes out. Um, so it gives a little bit of a, a prioritization bump to the words that you that you enter here. Um, so I thought if uh, if you'd like, George, we could do a little test here and uh, sure. you know see how this actually works. So um, I'm going to I gave you a paragraph before the show that has a bunch yeah, of names it. in it and a bunch of yeah uh, I got it on this cue card and I have no idea what you wanted <laughs> me to do with it, but now it all makes sense. <laughs> Why don't we go ahead? I'm going to start transcription and we'll get you to read that paragraph before we've uh, used the speech context feature and we'll see what kind of results we get. Sure. So, I'm just going to hit start. I'm going to switch over to this tab here where I've got a nice big um, browser window to show um, the words that are being recognized. And I'll kick it over to you, George, and you can uh, just start reading that paragraph. Sure. All right. We've been producing the Live at Epifan show for over four years. The show's been hosted by many of Epifan's employees, including Marta Tranova, George Birchall, Dan Wallace, myself, George Herbert, Greg Quirk, Mathieu Renault, Philip Sandler, and we've also had dozens of guests join us from all over the world. Among others, uh, our guests include Tim Doherty from Wowza, Eamon Drew from Bird Dog, Anthony Barakas from Stream For Us, Aaron Parecki, Photo Joseph, and Curtis Judd. Okay, great. I'm just going to stop the transcription, or pause it, rather. And let's take a look at what kind of results we got there. So you were reading out a whole <laughs> bunch of names, uh, some sort of uh, YouTuber creator names as well. Um, mm -hmm. And we got some mixed results. So it looks like Marta Trinova <laughs> was Marta Trinova. Um, That's closer actually, than it's been in the past. Yeah, uh, George Birchall, um, it got. Oftentimes we see George Virtual. Um, with Virtual, the speech recognition, yes. but it got it a little more correct here, but the spelling was wrong. Dan Wallace, no problem. George Herbert, no problem. Um, Greg Quirk, that's okay. It looks like we had some trouble with Matt Renault. Um, <laughs> Always do. Aaron Parecki missed. Anthony Barocas became Anthony Brock. Um, Curtis Judd became Curtis Jack. So we ran into some, you know, some accuracy problems with these proper names. I'll see. Let, let's uh, let's go back and let's try the speech context feature. So I'm going to stop the the stop the transcription first, and I'm just going to go down to the bottom here, and I've got a list of all the names in that paragraph that you just read. So you just enter them quite literally one by one, separated by a comma, just like this, and. I think that's about right. I don't know if I should have the comma between the names or not. There might be some experimentation there between first and last names, but let's just try it as is. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and start the transcription again. We'll flip over and George, why don't you read that paragraph again and we'll see what kind of results we get. Sure. We've been producing the live at Epifan show for over four years. The show's been hosted by many of Epifan's employees, including Marta Tranova, 
George Burchill, Dan Wallace, myself, George Herbert, Greg Quirk, Mathieu Renault, Philip Sandler, and we've had dozens of guests join us from all over the world. Among others, our guests have included Tim Doherty from Wowza, Eamon Drew of Bird Dog, Anthony Barakas of Stream For Us, Aaron Parecki, Photo Joseph, and Curtis Judd. Okay, I'm just gonna pause and we'll go and look at what kind of results we got. So right off the top, like we got much better results this time around. So Marta Huge Chernova, difference. correct. George Birchill, correct with spelling. Uh, yourself and myself, correct. We got Mathieu Renaud, which is a difficult name. Um, it looks like the only place it had a little bit of trouble was with Yuan. It, it went with Yuan. But uh, Bird Dog, Anthony Barokas, um, Aaron Parecki, Photo Joseph, Curtis Judd, all correct. So we went from something wow. like maybe 50% accuracy to closer maybe to like... even below. Yeah. Yeah, to closer to like 90%, um, which is impressive. This seems to be um, something that could uh, improve overall the, the recognition of proper names. Um, Absolutely. No, that's a very impressive difference. Um, you know, it's... Today it's names, tomorrow the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for reading that, George. Uh, very well dictated. Um, I try. So yeah, if you <laughs> want to check out the, uh, the new speech context feature with your live script, once again, all you have to do is reboot your device and you'll find the option in your Epifan cloud, cloud dashboard. Um, and just start entering your words and you're all set. Um, if you do have any feedback on the feature, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can uh, send us an email at info at and we'd be happy to uh, dive into your use case a little more and, uh, you know, uh, interested to learn whatever experience you might have with this feature. Definitely. Um, so that about wraps it up for today, George, in the kitchen. Um, is there anything else yeah. that we wanted to cover off this week? Well, I mean, other than shouting out our, <laughs> our own content, um, we have some uh, upcoming webinars uh, next week. Um, we're going to be talking about the Pearl family uh, next Wednesday, so definitely check that out. And we have some other ones coming later on as well. We did get a question in chat uh, from uh, our good friend from Uganda, who has been joining us a lot on our streams recently, which is awesome. Um, just asking, do you have to open any ports on the router for, for to allow SRT streaming? Um, there's a little more context required to that. <laughs> um, generally speaking, for sending an outbound stream, uh, a caller mode, if you will, um, from, from a source outbound, no. You generally don't as long as the port you've chosen to use for SRT is not specifically blocked. If you're a listener, the, the ingestion side, the receiving side, then you might, depending, again, on a number of factors. Or the alternative and the cool part with SRT is you can also use rendezvous mode where the two ends basically meet in the middle and should both be able to traverse the firewalls without difficulty. Um, so um, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we've, we've done a whole bunch of stuff around SRT. So if you want to check out that content in other videos and webinars, uh, for really detailed stuff on how SRT works, check that out. Um, but yeah, there's context is important with SRT sometimes depending on the modes and whether you're the sender or receiver. Aside from that, um, really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed some of the topics and I hope it gave you some food for thought and things to think about, things to try. Um, that's kind of our goal. Um, our next episode will be in a while, right? Because I think we have yeah, a two holiday. Weeks. Yeah, actually, I think we're taking a hiatus um, the first week of July. So we might not be yeah. back until just after that. But Yeah, uh, so... For those who don't, yeah, so it'll be, I guess, July 15th um, It will be the next show, which is quite a bit of a break. That's almost a month. I'm going to um, miss you, But that's George. because, yeah, <laughs> that's because July 1st is Canada Day here, and that's an important holiday for us. So we'll be taking a little bit of a break. Just happens to fall on a Thursday this year. So uh, we'll be there. But of course, we will be back after that. So to stay in touch with all the things, make sure to follow, like, subscribe in all the different places, Facebook, YouTube, and so on. And uh, we will keep you updated as we come up with things. We do have some cool plans coming for those future shows. 
Um, I don't want to give them away yet, but we're working on a guest that I think is going to be really awesome and really interesting for people. I can't wait. Until then, yeah. let's say goodbye for now. Uh, so yeah. long, everyone. Bye, everyone.